In the parable of the sheep and goats, Jesus makes it clear that a life worthy of the reward of heaven must involve actively helping people in need. I'm reading from the 25th chapter of the Gospel of Matthew, beginning with verse 31. Now when the human one comes in his majesty and all his angels are with him, he will sit on his majestic throne. All the nations will be gathered in front of him. He will separate from them from each other, just as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right side, but the goats he will put on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who will receive good things from my father, inherit the kingdom that was prepared for you before the world began. I was hungry, and you gave me food to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothes to wear. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then those who are righteous will reply to him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you a drink? When, when did we see you as a stranger and welcome you, or naked and give you clothes to wear? When did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? Then the king will reply to them, I assure you that when you have done it for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you have done it for me. This is the word of God for the people of God. smartphone, you probably recognize this. This is facial recognition technology. And this technology uses biomapping to make an imprint of your face and then compare that information with a database of known faces, and then it can identify you when it makes a match. And on your phone, it gives you the ability to unlock your phone or to give you access to secure accounts. It is your unique and individual password, your ID. Well, there's a man named Marty Dorschlag who has this superpower that matches facial recognition. You see, Marty can remember a face forever. In an interview on NPR, he said that if he looks at a face for just 30 seconds... He can remember that face for years and years and years. You might call him the recognizer. For example, he once attended a Michigan-Ohio State football game, and three years later, he recognized the man that he sat behind in the Dallas-Fort Worth airport. Did he remember the score of the game? He did not, but he remembered that face. Or there was the time when he was eating in a Las Vegas restaurant, and he said to the server, have you ever worked at this particular restaurant in Columbus, Ohio, as a server years years ago? The server was blown away because he had. The recognizer struck again. (laughs) You know, scientists have a name for people who have this exceptional ability to recognize faces. They are called super recognizers. Now, if you remember a face, perhaps in TV shows or commercial or ads, these nameless people, but you recognize them, you too may be a super recognizer. But here's the thing. Just as some people are super recognizers at recognizing faces, most of us fall into this typical recognizer category. According to Neuroscience News, psychologists have discovered that the ability to recognize faces varies a great deal, kind of like our ability to sing. Now, most of us will never sing like Adele. Most of us are just typical singers, just like most of us are typical face recognizers. You know, Scripture tells us that even people as familiar as Jesus can be difficult to recognize. You might remember on that first Easter morning, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb expecting to mourn the death of Jesus, but the stone had been rolled away and the body was gone. So she stood outside the tomb weeping. 
And there was this man standing off to the side, and he said, Woman, why are you weeping? Who are you looking for? She thought this was the gardener. She couldn't imagine why this man was talking to her. What she didn't know is that was Jesus. We don't know why she didn't recognize him. The Bible doesn't tell us that, but we know she didn't until Jesus said her name. And then Mary recognized Jesus, and her life was changed by recognizing Jesus. And so today our question is, how can we become super recognizers to identify Jesus in the world around us? Or in the final week of this message series called Plugged In, where we have been taking time over the last two weeks to look at the mission statement in Messiah Church, and that is growing disciples by loving God, loving each other, and loving the world. This statement shapes who we are and how we do ministry. And so today we're going to take a look at that final end of the statement, what it means to love the world by seeing Jesus in the world. Ron Heifetz is an expert in leadership. And we've shared this example with you before, but I think it bears repeating. He says that leaders have a way of realizing the world as it is now. But they also have the ability to cast a vision about how the world is supposed to be. So they can lay out this this plan that the world is here, but with a vision, the world could be here. And our job as Christians is to close that gap between the world as it is and the world as it is supposed to be. We don't have a world that looks like that right now, but this is a world full of compassion and kindness, a world that is where poverty and oppression and injustice and racism exist no more. Jesus referred to this as the kingdom of God. And you know, every time we pray the Lord's Prayer like we did just a couple of minutes ago, we are praying for that kingdom to come, that world to come. We're not only praying for that kingdom to come, but we're saying we want to be a part of that transformation through the work of our hands. And so today, as we consider how Messiah Church can and should live into our vision, let's consider the parable of the sheep and the goats. Now, a parable isn't a story that is meant to be taken literally, word for word, as it is told. It is a story that is meant to drive home a point and then capture your heart and compel you to action. In the parable today, Jesus illustrates what the criteria is that will be used on that final judgment day. He illustrates what it means to be intentional about caring for others. It was a few days before Jesus' crucifixion, and he had come to Jerusalem knowing that he was going to die. And after talking about the temple's destruction and the end of the world, sometimes in very puzzling terms, he paints this picture of what the final judgment will look like. His story about the judgment clearly conveys kingdom principles. He says that kingdom people care for those who are hungry and those who are thirsty They care for strangers and poorly clothed. They visit prisoners and they care for the sick. These are the people who Jesus called the least of my brothers and sisters. So the parable begins like this. Now when the human one comes in his majesty and all his angels are with him, he will sit on his majestic throne. All the nations will be gathered in front of him and he will separate them from each other just as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. This scene is captured in the 1534 fresco painting by Michelangelo in the the Sistine Chapel. It's called The Last Judgment. And here in the middle you can see Christ, and he is um, directing some people to his right, the sheep to his right, to live eternal life. And others he's directing to his left. These are the goats. To be, lived with, to be lived in eternity among the damned. And to those on his right, he's saying, Come, you who will receive good things from my Father, inherit the kingdom that was prepared for you before the world began. But to those on his left, he's saying, Get away from me, you who will receive terrible things. Go in into the unending fire that has been prepared for the devil and his angels. 
Now, in hearing this parable, you can imagine his disciples were confused and probably a little scared and upset. And so they asked, what is the difference between a sheep and a goat? Well, Jesus says to the sheep, I was hungry and you gave me food to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me in. I was naked and you gave me clothes to wear. I was sick and you took care of me. I was in prison and you visited me. But to the goats, those on his left, he replies, I was hungry and you didn't give me food to eat. I was thirsty and you didn't give me a drink of anything. I was a stranger and you didn't welcome me. I was naked and you didn't give me clothes to wear. I was sick and in prison and you didn't visit me. I find it very interesting that both those who were accepted in and those who were turned away were surprised at the answers. See, I think they all expected to see Jesus in the holy places, in the religious places. I don't think they expected to find him among the needy and the poor. But Jesus' story shows us that we should care for all people in need and treat them the way we would treat Jesus. When he uses these words, brothers and sisters of mine, some translations use the word family. He's making it very clear that we are to care for everyone, not just those that look like us or think like us or vote like us or even those who are not followers of Jesus. We should care for everyone. In fact, this parable tells us that Jesus takes it very personally how we care for others. He says, what you do or don't do for other people is what you do or don't do for me. So our question to ask ourselves today is, am I a sheep or a goat? You know, two weeks ago, we talked about this word for love that's used in the New Testament, this word agape. And this kind of love isn't that romantic, fuzzy feeling, warm, cozy kind of love. This is a kind of love that compels us intentionally into action to care for one another. Some of you have been around Messiah Church for a year or so now might remember that last fall we did a sermon series on the five essential practices or disciplines that those who follow Jesus practice and help us grow deeper in our faith. Do you remember what they were? They were worship, prayer, study, serving, and giving. And as today we consider the practice of serving one another, you might remember we used five fingers. Five fingers were a reminder to us to do five intentional acts of kindness towards others. Five acts today, or five acts this week. It could be something as, as, un, as an unexpected word of encouragement or word of appreciation. It might mean giving up your space in the grocery store line or at the gas pump for someone who's in a hurry more than you. Those are the the vows, these five things, this worship, prayer, service, study, and giving are the five vows of membership that United Methodists take and confirmands are what we talked about last week and what you will be affirming today as part of your confirmation rite. And you know, then this last summer, we looked at Paul's letter to the Thessalonians, and we learned that our faith produces our works, and not the other way around. We are saved by God's grace, and God's mercy, and God's love. There is nothing we can do to earn our salvation. It is a gift from God. But our salvation isn't just about us getting to heaven. It is about bringing that kingdom of heaven here on earth in the here and the now. So in this parable, Jesus isn't talking about us earning our way to heaven. He's referring about how our life of faith compels us to respond in love. A faith that means we live differently in this world by the way we treat one another our spouses, our partners, our family members, and our friends. It might mean we have a little more patience and graciousness with our neighbors or our coworkers or our classmates at school. And it means when we see someone in need, we respond. Because when misery and pain and brokenness are a part of this world, God hearts break, God hearts breaks, and his response is to send. 
You know, caring for other people is at the core of what it means to be a Methodist. The very first Methodist fed the hungry. They created schools for children. They set up clinics to give away free medication to people who couldn't afford it. They would visit people in prisons. They stood up against slavery, and they created places for widows and orphans to live. The very first Methodist lived out in tangible ways what this parable talks about, to live life as a sheep. Do you remember the three simple rules of being a Methodist? They are, do no harm, do good, and stay in love with God. Perhaps you've seen these t-shirts around here this summer. These are the t-shirts from our Storm Camp mission trip that many of our youth went on. Some of you might have this shirt, right? Yep, yep. They went out into the world to do good, to love and care for others. So how can we recognize Jesus in the world around us? He may not be as clear at every moment, just like he wasn't clear to Mary that morning at the empty tomb, but he is present in the power of his resurrection life. And he comes to us in people who are hungry and thirsty and in need of clothing. And when we serve vulnerable people, we become super recognizers of Jesus in the world. So let me share with you just a few ways that I see you, Messiah Church, being super recognizers and caring for people in this world, the way I see you being sheep. You know, just this last week, you welcomed into this church the Native American course of study. This is a course of study for people that are being sent into Native American communities by the United Methodist Church to share the love of Jesus And just this last week, there were 15 students and professors in our building throughout the week, and they studied, and they prayed, and they worshiped, and they shared community, they shared meals, and they created support systems for one another. And then on Thursday night, right here in this space, there was a worship service and a graduation, and three brand new licensed local pastors were sent out into the world as United Methodist pastors, to share the love of Jesus. Those of us who served, those of you who served, and there were many of you throughout the week, you had this really unique opportunity and privilege to listen and learn about Native American history from their point of view. Now, we may never see any or most of these people again, but our lives have been changed because you welcomed in these folks that you didn't even know You extended gracious hospitality. In 2021, when the Taliban began taking over Afghanistan, the Afghani people began fleeing their homeland in fear for their lives. So in response to this humanitarian crisis, just as you had done in 2018 with the Agid family, I just want to share a picture one more time. This is Akeni Agid going off to college just last month. Well done. Well done, servants. Well, this January, you welcomed in an Afghani family, the Amini family. Here they are when they first arrived in January from Afghanistan. And just a couple of weeks ago, they welcomed this new precious boy into their family. And here's the dad whispering the name of God into this baby's ear. In all of these cases, you welcomed in strangers. You pulled your gifts and your talents and your resources to care for those who at that moment so desperately needed it. Again, this year, for the fifth year in a row, you are providing snacks for Oakwood Elementary School, one of our community partners just across the street. Now, to you, a snack may not seem like it's really that important, but when children come to school hungry or they forget their lunch, or they don't have a lunch to bring. Their tummies are hungry, and hungry kids can't learn. You know, before we learned about this, teachers were purchasing these snacks out of their own resources because they knew how important this was. And so not only by providing snacks are you helping the children, you are also supporting the teachers. Throughout this month of September, our second mile giving, that extra opportunity for you to give is going to purchase snacks for children at Oakwood. We will send about 6,000 snacks across the street at the end of this month. 
And we'll probably do this again in January because those snacks will be gone and it'll be our turn to step up again to love these kids in this community. You may recall that our Christmas Eve offering goes to other people, other missions outside the walls of this church. And this last Christmas, half of it went to an organization called H2O for Life. Over $15,000 went to H2O for Life. And we were able to, you were able to, support this primary school in Molly Molly to dig a well for these little kids. That project was completed in June, shared some stories with you about that. There's more information in Heritage Hall on the wall if you'd like to read a little bit more. But here's what I want to tell you about. Just this last week, we learned that the rest of the project has been completed. So we had some extra funds, and so we were able to partner with a couple of other organizations to provide another bore well at a secondary school in Tanzania. This school is home to boys and girls, 646 of them. And so because of you, these kids also have a clean, safe source of water. This is just the tip of the iceberg of what you are doing, Messiah Church. And if I told you recently how proud I am to be your pastor, and how excited I am to help cast a vision for our future, and then to see what's going to happen to see how you live out your faith in this community, how you show up and make this world a better place, how you bring the kingdom of God here on earth. You know, as I think about this parable and I ask myself, am I a sheep or a goat? Do I feed the hungry? Do I give water to the thirsty? Have I clothed the naked? Do I visit people in prison and do I care for the sick? I know I try, but often I fall short. And so will you. But because of God's grace, we are forgiven. We are loved. And so we try and we try again. Because when we serve children, when we welcome guests, when we feed the poor, we are really serving Jesus. And when we provide clean water, when we care for the sick, and when we clothe those in need, we are really caring for Jesus. And the good news is today that vulnerable people in our life give us an opportunity to be super recognizers of Jesus and to show up in this world to love and care for the world as Jesus calls us to do. Let's pray. Teach us, Lord, to serve you as you deserve, to count and to give and not count the cost to fight and not heed the wounds, to toil and not to seek rest, to labor and not ask for any reward except for the knowledge that we do your will. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.